Yeah. 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 All right, what's up, all you passive income enthusiasts out there? My name is Dustin Heiner. This is the Master Passive Income Podcast. I'm so glad you guys are here with me today. Now, in Master Passive Income, we talk all about real estate rental properties and how you can quit your job and make money every single month as opposed to earning money. Remember, if you are earning money, you work a job for one hour, you get paid for that one hour of your life spent at that job. Well, with passive income and rental properties, you work one time by buying a house, employing your property manager on it, and then you make money year after year after year until you sell it or give it to your kids or your estate or whatever, but it never goes away. It keeps on growing and growing and growing. That's how I was able to quit my job when I was just 37 years old. Now I live the dream life, and I just got back from a hunting trip with my kids, got a deer, and I'll tell you about that in just a second. So today's session, we're going to be talking all about getting others on board investing with you, and especially your spouse. What's rather interesting is a lot of my students, there are married couples and one of them is gung ho with investing in real estate. The other one is very, very hesitant, very, very shy, or very, very concerned that they're going to lose all their money, their hard earned money. And I completely understand that. In fact, I went through that. I am very gung ho. My wife is absolutely not. So we're going to dive into talking about how we can get other people, especially our spouses, involved in our real estate investing. All right, let's jump in there. Let's get started and let's help others see the vision that we have to change our life with real estate rental properties and how you will be able to quit your job with real estate rental properties. All right, guys, let's go. Welcome to the Master Passive Income Podcast, where we talk about investing in real estate rental properties with a special focus on making enough money so you can quit your job and live the dream life. And now, here's your host, Dustin Heiner. Hey guys, so thank you so much again for being here with me. Now, if you remember last week, I told you that I would be out next week and possibly miss a podcast session because I would be out hunting and hopefully getting a deer. Now, praise the Lord, I was able to get a deer and it's actually Tuesday. So hunting, the the window for hunting was from Friday of last week all the way till Sunday of the following week. So it's a little like week and a, and a couple days of hunting. And so I went out on Friday hiked two miles uphill, like literally up the mountain, um, up a big canyon. It was probably about two miles, about 2,000 feet climbing. Found some deer tracks, deer sign, didn't see any deer. So I was really bummed out. There was the entire day spent and then uh, stayed the night there. Then the next day, I actually drove home because I wanted to try a whole brand new area, but I also wanted to pick up the kids. And so I drove home and actually picked up two of my kids, my boys, they really wanted to go with me hunting. And we were planning on just going for one day, um, going up and coming right back. It's a three hour drive. So it's kind of a little bit of a drive, but I wanted to get one day of hunting in with them and then go back up myself. But it turns out that as we were driving up to the spot, you know, we're praying that we find a buck and, and, uh, really looking forward to it. And we get to a certain spot. I just picked it on the map. I said, Hey, there might be some water here. It looks like there's a, like a ponding basin or not really a ponding basin, but like a reservoir type type spot that the deer we might drink and here's a road I can drive on. Now, if you listen to my podcast session number 19, where I talked about how I still drive a 2007 Honda Odyssey, even though I have plenty of money to buy a new one, I just don't need a new one. I like spending my time and money doing things like traveling for six weeks around Japan or traveling for six weeks around Europe. And I just don't need a, you know, a fancy brand new car because I need a car to get me from point A to point B. But in this instance, I was going to go hunting and I was going to drive off of back roads. So I went and rented a truck for $200 for, I think it was like six days or seven days. It was a great deal. Brand new uh, F-150, Ford F-150. Rented that truck and then drove. Drove to up up in the mountains, up in Flagstaff area. Anyway, so I went hunting. And um, so really quickly, I want to explain what happened. So we get up there with my boys. We're really going to hunt, you know, the night and then the morning and then come home. But we get there and we start driving down the road. I just picked out the map and we look over to the left hand side after driving maybe for like two minutes on really slowly down this dirt road. And we look over. My boy says, hey, look at deer. And we see 
seven, like seven deer in one section just walking together. Well, there was, I believe, one or two bucks, and they just took off running. I didn't get a chance to get a shot on them. Well, the next day, we did not see them at all, which was a bummer. Um, we, we saw elk. I saw a total of eight elk in that same area, which was awesome. Um, but then the next day, um, didn't see them at all. But then we started hiking down this path along the right side. So the first day, we saw them on the left side of the road. On the right side, we start walking down the, another dirt road that kind of ventures off to the right. And we found the deer and they got spooked and they ran off. You know, my boys were kicking rocks and, and doing stuff like that. They're really actually good hunters. Just, um, you know, sometimes, you know, boys can be boys, but anyway, so I realized that they're the general area that they are. And so that night I said, you know what, at three 30, let's go out in this one spot. I think they might be coming. Well, Praise the Lord. This was on Monday night. So we started on Saturday afternoon, hunted sun- Saturday evening, Sunday, then Monday afternoon. 3 30 uh, to 4 o'clock, I get to the spot. I was like, okay, I think they're going to be here on the left or on the right. We can watch them coming in and coming down little by little. We can watch them eat and stuff. So if we hunker down here, we might be able to see them. Well, what happened was we actually found a big boulder that we got to hide behind. So we got to lean against that and watch. But Within four minutes of us standing there, I'm looking to the to the right side where I, we saw the deer that morning. I say, there's a deer. Like, there's a deer. Don't move. Don't move. Everybody, don't move. And I'm looking down. And I see more deer start walking. And they're about 120 yards away. So they're a good distance. So they can't really see us. Plus, we're behind a boulder. And so I prop my my gun up on the boulder. And I'm getting ready to shoot. I'm waiting for the buck. And I see, you know, all the does and fawns walk by. But then there's one buck. And my older son, he's nine years old. He said, hey, dad, should we plug our ears before you shoot? I said, sure, son. It's, it's going to be a while because I need to make sure I get a good shot. And my younger son, the seven-year-old, he puts his ears, his, um, you know, his fingers in his ears really, really quickly. And I'm still waiting for a shot. I'm waiting for a shot. And then all of a sudden I hear... And my seven-year-old falls asleep. He been, he's been hunting, you know, waking up at five o'clock, going to bed at nine, walking all day, hunting all day. So he fell asleep. And then, uh, praise the Lord, the, the buck got right in front of me. I took a bead right at his shoulder because he wasn't really, he wasn't positioned prone, but there were trees and I had to take a shot right away. The best shot I've taken in a long time on a deer dropped him like that. Right where he stood, he dropped down. I've rarely seen a deer of mine just completely drop down flat. My my seven-year-old, he woke up. I was like, what was that? And then he went right back to sleep, but he started snoring again. All the deer took off. And so great time. Got a deer. I'll put pictures on the show notes page. And if you want to go to the podcast show notes, you can go to masterpassiveincome.com forward slash zero three one. And you go there, you can see there everything we talk about today. And you can also see pictures of me and my boys hunting. And it was great. And, you know, praise the Lord, we got the deer. And I say praise the Lord because we were just praying, Lord, please bless us with a deer. Put the deer in our hands. It'd be great to be able to get a deer. And so we did. Um, I was able to gut them right there. We heard coyotes howling about, I want to say, maybe less than a mile away. They were pretty loud. And there were a lot of them. So we were getting kind of worried because it was like 4.30 to, no, about 5.30 by the time we got to the deer. We were gutting them and that smell's going to go everywhere. And and anyway, so I'm probably grossing a lot of people out. So sorry about that. But it, I got my boys to be able to see what it's like to hunt a deer. They're super excited. Quarter them out. Now I've already got them all dressed and we got meat for the family. So we're really blessed to have plenty of meat in the freezer. So terrific time. Now, like I said, with my real estate rental properties, I am able to do whatever I want, whenever I want. Like I literally don't need to work ever again because I have money coming in that I make money. Now I don't earn money because I'm not working at all. I make money where it didn't exist. So I bought that property. I started a brand new business, hired a property manager. They manage the properties for me and I make money every single month. When I'm hunting, I'm still making money because my properties are making money. Now, it wasn't always this easy for me to buy properties. Now, I know I wherever you are, I probably was there. Um, and so today, we're going to be looking at how you can get other people investing with you, especially your spouse. Now, I know I've talked about this a few times on the podcast that my spouse has more of a reluctant reluctance to debt, as well as a reluctance to possibly losing money. Obviously, nobody wants to lose money. When you have a guaranteed income from a job, then that's that makes it so much easier. You're just guaranteed a check to come in. 
But when you buy a rental property, you're not necessarily guaranteed anything at all. Actually, not necessarily. You actually are not guaranteed anything at all. In fact, you're guaranteed that you're going to have to make sure that the business runs well in order for you to make money. You have to make sure that you get the right tenants in there, you fix it up right, have a good property manager over it. Once you set up the business right, like I can show you how to do it, once you do that, it's an automatic business running itself. Now, when you're thinking about having your spouse with you investing, a lot of people that I talk to, they have a spouse who is very hesitant, where they are gung-ho, they have bought in the vision, they understand, they know exactly where they're going, what they want to do. And I actually was the same way where I knew exactly where I wanted to go. I wanted to buy many, many properties very, very fast and create passive income. But my wife, God bless her, she's fantastic. She really helped me to rein it in to make sure we grow at a good, consistent, um, uh, consistent is not the best word, a good pace where we're not over leveraged, we're not getting too much debt, and we're making sure that we're not getting ahead of ourselves where we're getting too many properties and we can't cover expenses because we're, we're paying you know more money for fixing up a new property, getting more loans, all that sort of stuff. So we are so blessed that we have, you know, 35, 36, however many properties now I kind of lose track because I buy and sell, but, um, I think only four of them have actual mortgages on them. The rest are all uh, free and clear. So that's fantastic. But I protect them by having a business over the property. I have um, liability insurance. I even have an umbrella policy, all that. So we're really protected, but it did all didn't start that way. It started with me having the dream the vision, the idea that we can buy a rental property and make money without working. So my wife, she grew up with her mom and dad, terrific people. Her dad was a teacher and her mom was a stay at home mom. She did have a few jobs here and there, but you know, they're, they're much more reserved, much less um, entrepreneurial. And you know, they, they knew that they worked and they got a paycheck, which is a great thing to do. I, on the other hand, was much more entrepreneurial where I had a paper route when I was, you know, 13 years old, delivering newspapers, working for myself. I've had a a graphic design company. I've had a skateboard manufacturing company. I've had a um, retail business. I've had so many different types of businesses. And the easiest one is actually real estate rental properties. And as well as my dad has his own construction company, my stepdad, or sorry, my stepdad has his own construction company. My biological dad had a convenience store that he ran for years and years and years and, and, and quit and sold or sorry, he sold the business and did really, really well. And so I was always driven to be entrepreneurial and to work for myself. Now, my wife, on the other hand, was was raised, you know, you don't really take risks or they really didn't even talk about it. It was just, you know, you get a job and you work hard and you, you know, you make your money, which is a great thing, but it's not where I was. And so I had the vision of having a rental property empire or empire is a kind of a, uh, big word or silly word that you can just, I just wanted a business that money came in without me working and I can do whatever I want. Now, fast forward 10, I think it's 11 or 12 years now of investing. I was able to quit my job at 37 years old. So about nine years of investing, I was able to quit my job and now I will never, ever need a job again. It's just super amazing. So I wanted to bring on my lovely wife onto the podcast so she, you, so you can hear her words. And I'm going to interview her. I'm not going to be too extensive, but I'm going to get her train of thought because I don't think like her. Like she, uh, God bless her. She's helped me so much because I'm so gung ho that I probably would have, you know, done some bad decisions. I, I know I did do some bad decisions and lost lots of money. I didn't have somebody coaching me, showing me how to do it. So I've lost twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars in loss of rents or expenses or tenants, you know, not paying, whatever it might be. I've had all those expenses, but my wife has helped me because she's very, very smart. She's really great with numbers, but she's also been the way for me to keep a good um, handle on the business and not let it get too big, too fast. That's our perspective. So let me bring on my wife. I'll ask her a few questions and have her give you her perspective so you can understand what somebody who has more of like a, not really a skeptic, but more a reservation or concern and see what they're thinking. And now after the fact, you know, after, you know, 10, 11, 12 years, I can't remember how many, it was probably 11 years of investing. Now, um, just, you know, a few months ago, I said, Hey babe, I just bought three single family homes and a duplex and, uh, we'll be making, I don't know, $1,500 a month. And she goes, well, good. And I didn't have to tell her, you know, anything about that. It didn't lead up into it. I just said, Hey, today we bought these. And she's all, that's great because she knows the business runs really well. We have a great business. 
And I'm so glad to have my lovely bride, Melissa, to be here on the show with me. She's fantastic. She's helped out so much. She's a little nervous because she's never been on a podcast before and done something like this with her voice. So give her a little bit of leeway if you have a little bit of the hiccups here and there. But anyways, hey, babe, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you, hun, for having me. You're supposed to call me Stud Muffin, not hun. <laughs> That's what you would like me to call you. I'm just kidding. Anyway, hey, so I'm really glad that you're, you're here. I know a lot of our students are really concerned about having their spouse come on board and their spouse are, spouses are concerned about you know losing money. They don't really see the vision that we as investors like myself um, see. And they, 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 they understand the vision, but they're not bought into it. So let me ask you a few questions. I'm going to interview you because I want everybody to see what it's like from the perspective of somebody else that is not necessarily gung-ho and catch the vision of investing. So let me ask you the first question, hon. Tell me a little bit about yourself, you know, how you grew up, what your family's like, and, and everything about yourself before we met. Well, I grew up the youngest of three kids. I am the only girl. I have two older brothers. We grew up in a home that we lived in for pretty much our entire lives until after my high school year, until after I graduated high school. Uh, and then my parents moved, and that was the first time I ever moved. And before you met, what were you working to to or become? Or weren't you going to do something um, with getting a career or a job? So after high school, you know, you're told you got to go to college. That's the next step. So that's what I did when I went there. You know, I struggled at the beginning trying to figure out what I wanted to do. So I decided to become a teacher, which my dad had told me not to do because uh, he had been through there and done that. And so I, I went through the whole process, got to the end, and I just had a really bad experience the last semester of my fourth year in college, right when I was about to graduate, It's the, and it, it was just a really bad experience um, that I had. And so after that, I just thought, wow, I, I really don't want to be a teacher. Um, I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to deal with the politics and, you know, the the way the kids can be. Um, and so from there, I, I got my degree. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, well, now what? So I ended up working for a great company that I, I really loved and enjoyed, which was USAA. I worked in their bank department, did that for a while. And while I was there, I was like, okay, what's the next step? What should I do from here? And I thought, well, you know what? I really like math. I really like numbers and stuff. Maybe I'll be an accountant. So I applied with USAA to, to get, you know, further uh, college credit and maybe get a master's. And I thought, well, let's do accounting because that sounds like something I would enjoy. So I started doing that and, and I just barely got started when I met my husband. And so things started progressing really quickly with my future husband at the time, future to be husband. And so I thought, well, I don't really want to do this if I'm going to be moving and I got a husband and I just don't have time for this right now and I'm working. And so I, I quit that. Um, so we got married shortly after that and I moved to California and yeah, I, and then I just kind of did some odd jobs here and there. And then my husband and his brother and, and myself and my sister-in-law, we started a, a store and we did that for a while and I worked that full time. And then once I started having kids, I'm like, okay, you know what? I, I would like to be a stay at home mom. I, I really want to be able to be there for my kids and, and not, you know, have to rely on other people, pay other people to take care of my kids. And then later on regret not spending enough time with my kids. So that's kind of, you know, what happened with the way everything went. That's great. So thanks for sharing that. Now, what was it like being with somebody that's like me, who is entrepreneurial, who's definitely like a go-getter and, you know, driven to, um, you know, have ambition and succeed and, and driven to start businesses and things like that? What's, what was it like when you're not necessarily like that, but you're smart, you can definitely do all the businesses, but you're not as gung-ho. What was it like being um, married to, to somebody like me? Well, it had its good things and its bad things. Um, I always you know, envisioned myself marrying a man that was driven. And, you know, I didn't want some guy who was just, you know, okay, making minimum wage and, you know, or living at home with his parents and, and not really, you know, being very ambitious. So 
I was really looking for someone who was going to provide for a family because I I wanted to have a family. I wanted to have kids. And I really wanted to be a stay-at-home mom. You know, my mom growing up, she was a stay-at-home mom. And I just loved the fact that she was always there for me when I was young and I'd come home from school. I had a really good friend growing up and her mom was never home. And, you know, I just, you know, felt like I was so blessed um, that I had a mom that was there all the time, whereas other people didn't, you know, you see those latchkey kids and I just, you know, didn't want to be that. And so I didn't want that for my kids. So I was definitely looking for someone who, you know, was kind of more take charge and, and wanted to work and provide for a family. And so I was kind of looking for that when I met my husband. And, and he definitely has proven that to to be true with himself. Um, he's very driven. And I like that about him. But it can also be kind of hard sometimes when you're not quite sure about the decisions that, you know, your spouse makes. Um, because we don't always agree with everything that the other person makes decision wise. And so that was kind of a struggle, especially at the beginning when I was like, okay, well, let's go a little bit slower on this. Let's not move so quickly. Um, I don't want to be in a lot of debt. I don't, you know, I, I had, uh, my great grandfather, um, went into debt right before the great depression hit and they lost everything. They lost their land and, you know, my grandparents, my grandpa had to go work um, picking oranges, and, you know, in California for a, a period of time before he came back to Arizona. Um, but anyways, I just I, I didn't want to have to deal with something like that happening. I, I don't like having debt. I grew up being told, you know, you don't have debt. You know, you pay everything off. You don't charge anything on a credit card that you can't pay off in your bank account. And you pay it off right away. You don't make payments. You just you pay it all in full. And so that's kind of my, my mindset is that you don't want to have debt. And, you know, growing up, I never had debt. I was a saver. I saved. And then when we got married, I had no debt. I had money in my bank account and I saved. So do you remember when I told you when we were dating and we were engaged and I said, hey, when you marry me, you're not going to have a boring life. Did I live up to that <laughs> that statement that I actually said, you're not going to have a boring life if you marry me? So yeah, I mean, you've definitely kept us busy. We've done a lot of traveling. Um, we've done all kinds of stuff. So we've been to, let's see, the first place you ever took me was to Jamaica for our honeymoon. From there, we've been to Hawaii. We've been to several different states in the United States. Um, we've been to the East Coast. We've been to the North and West Coast. Um, we've been to... 11 different countries over in Europe. Uh, we've been to Japan. And all of these trips are not just like one or two day trips or anything like that. You know, our trip to Japan was, what was it, like six weeks long. And our trip to Europe was about the same, about six weeks or so, maybe more than six weeks long. Um, so yeah, and then even our trip to Hawaii, I think was what, like, four days to a week long, something like that. I think it was a whole week. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, you just kept us busy with that kind of stuff. We go camping a lot. You go hunting a lot. Um, we're constantly traveling back and traveling back and forth between California and Arizona. Um, we've just done a lot. I mean, we traveled a lot even in California itself. So, now, let's talk a little bit about your perspective in investing. So what was your view of investing in real estate or stocks, bonds, these CDs, and all this stuff as you were growing up? Well, growing up, I mean, my parents didn't talk too much about a lot of that stuff. I mean, when I heard about real estate, it was usually on, like, the TV when you hear those uh, commercials or those uh, shows where they're trying to sell you into – uh, investing with a company or, or learning to invest to buy real estate and stuff. And so that was kind of the extent of my knowledge on real estate. Um, when it comes to like stocks and bonds and stuff, I was always told, you know, don't get into stocks because it's like a gamble. You you don't know if it's going to go up or go down and it's, it's a constant flux and it's not reliable. And so I just never saw it as reliable, even when I worked a job and I had an IRA and I was able to move 
you know, the percentages or whatever around as I wanted to. And I could never seem to get anything right because every time I would go to check to see where the percentages were, I felt like I was always ending up in the red after it had been green. I thought, oh, good. This one's been green for a while. I should pick it. And, you know, it seems to be steady. And the next thing I know, I pick it. And a few days later, it ends up in the red. And I'm thinking, oh, why did it have to go red right when I just picked it? Um, and so, yeah, so I just never felt comfortable with a lot of that stuff. And then also with real estate, um, you know, I have heard different stories. Like one, I had an uncle who bought a house and then later he found out that the uh, property manager was telling the people that were renting it, that they were, that she was going to, that it was her house, that she owned it and that she was going to sell it to them. And so they're making payments extra, I think it was extra payments to her or something in the thought that they were buying it from her. And uh, obviously it wasn't hers because it was my uncle's and he found out. And anyways, everything ended up being okay. I think in the end, I'm not sure what happened to the gal herself. Um, But anyways, I mean, just different things like that happening. So you remember that first property that we bought, it was $17,000 and we just got married and we had money from that your parents gave us. We had your savings. I didn't have really any savings because I wasn't taught to save. And so we took all that money that we had and bought that first property. So why were you nervous and or hesitant to buy that first rental property? Well, I mean, it, we had our savings and we were going to use up all of our savings and it made me very nervous. I mean, when we got married, um, I never had any debt and you had some debt on your hands and I just was very scared that that this money was going to be spent and then, you know, things were going to crash and burn, especially since we'd never done any of this stuff before. I also was unsure about the property manager. You know, I was, I was very concerned about, you know, how well do we know this person? You know, what are we going to do to make sure that this person's being honest and truthful with us? You know, I, I don't want this person ending up stealing from us or robbing us, kind of like the gal uh, that did with my uncle. So, you know, I just had a lot of concerns about those things. And, you know, I also had concerns like, well, we need to have fire insurance because renters, you know, a lot of people smoke. And what if they accidentally set the house on fire? And so then there goes all of our money. And so just a, a lot of different thing, concerns that I had um, when it came to, you know, it working out OK and, and not losing all of our all of our money, all, the, all of our savings. Yeah, I remember getting that first property and and all the work that we did, you know, uh, planning and finding and all that sort of stuff. And obviously, we had a property manager overseeing the property, but it was just a lot of work making sure that we bought a good property. Now, we do it much better now because we've done it many times before. But what made you then okay with buying that first property? Well, I would say the biggest thing that helped me was just my faith in God because, you know, as a Christian, I know that no matter what happens, whether we lose everything, it's all in God's hands. And so I can't put all my faith and trust in my husband or the economy or anything else for the, our provision. You know, God calls our husbands to, you know, provide for their family. But at the same time, you know, in the end, we're ultimately relying on God. Um, and so that's just basically, I was like, okay, God, you know what? You tell us to to trust in you. You tr- tell us to, you tell us to be submissive to our husbands. And so I was like, okay, God, you know what? I'm just going to be obedient to you, Lord. And you say, as long as you are, we're obedient to you that, you know, you're going to take care of everything. And so it's like, okay, Lord, it's, it's all in your hands. Um, I'm going to be submissive to my husband. I'm going to let him make the final decision. I'm going to give him my concerns. And then once I give him my concerns, I'm going to release it and not worry about it and let God take care of it and rely on God to, to do everything in the end. That's fantastic. And that's something I absolutely love about you. Now, for the people who don't have a faith in God or who don't you know, uh, rely on God, now, there was something that I also did with you. I actually ran you through the numbers. I showed you the entire business from beginning to end. And I even show you the numbers, how we're going to make money, where the money's going, and every bit about the business, like you were basically inside my brain, knowing every every single thing. And I felt that was a help for you um, to get over a couple other questions, a couple other concerns and thoughts, even though you're relying on God. But 
for all of our other listeners who don't have that faith, um, you know, maybe that or did that help when I actually went through the numbers and showed you the business um, at, at, from beginning to end, from A to Z. I showed you the entire business. Did that help? Yes, it actually did help. I actually kind of forgot that you had done that at the beginning. Um, but yeah, that that did help me because, you know, for me, it's all about the numbers. You know, when I, we got married, I was like, okay, well, how much are our expenses? How much, you know, are we bringing in? Let's write it all down. Let's map it all out. And so, you know, I like to see it written down. I want to see, okay, this is what we're bringing in. This is what our expenses are. And I want to make sure everything's accounted for because I want to know what the bottom line is going to be. You know, I want to know, you know, okay, is there room for, okay, if we don't have renters this month or the next month or, you know, how much leeway do we have with all of that? And so, yes, you writing all that information down does help. And it really did help me a lot to to feel more comfortable with that. And so I remember it was probably a good six or seven properties in a row that I had to walk you through the numbers. And I would say had to, I wanted to, I wanted you to be on board. I wanted you to see what we're doing. And as well as any money that came in, I showed you this is where it went. This is how much money we made. So I was making you a big part of the process of the business. Now we did start having kids then. So you were much busier, obviously with them, which I'm very, very blessed. You were taking care of them so greatly. And I was able to focus on the business. So at what point in the business creation did you become more comfortable with investing where, you know, now I just say, hey, babe, I bought three properties and a duplex. And you say, okay, that's great. At what point was it that you started becoming more comfortable with investing in the business? Well, I started becoming more comfortable when things started to seem like they were working better. Um, At the beginning, uh, I didn't feel comfortable with the property manager. I had some questions and some doubts about her. And then later proved that some of my questions and doubts were right. And so we got rid of her and got a property manager that I felt more comfortable with, that I felt like we could trust better. Um, So that was a big thing. Um, Also, the longer we did the properties and the more things, you know, they started bringing in money, uh, the less it seemed like we had people leaving, coming and going constantly, the more it seemed like it was more of a steady income coming in, uh, less doubt and questions as to how much we're going to be bringing in. That's when I started feeling more comfortable. Um, And just the more it seemed like you seemed to know what you were doing, uh, the less mistakes you're making, the more it just seemed like, okay, Dusty's got this. Like he already knows what he's doing. He's been doing it for a while. Um, I, I guess just through all of that, I, I started feeling more comfortable about it all. And, and now it's just to the point where I'm like, okay, you've, you've got it. You know what you're doing. I I don't have to think or worry about it. Um, we have money coming in. I, you know, every now and then I'll just kind of question, okay, well, how much do we have coming in? Um, do we have any unrented properties? I know what our expenses are because I've, I'm very detail oriented. So when I figure out our expenses, I want to know everything down to the penny. And so, you know, I've done that um, in the past. And so I know what our expenses are. And as long as we're bringing in more money than our expenses, then I know, okay, we're good. We're good. That's, that's awesome. So, so for everybody out there listening, um, I am definitely not a budget person. Now, all my students that I coach, I definitely want them to have a budget and stay on budget. Now, I don't... um, I definitely put that upon myself and my family too. My wife is the budget person. I am absolutely not the budget person. She makes sure that we're we're saving money, we're doing well, and praise the Lord we've been doing well just because she's, you know, the one taking care of all the numbers. But everybody out there, you're going to hopefully have somebody that is in your, um, you know, you're married to that is going to be uh, the numbers person. It's going to be able to track every penny of it. Now, where my wife, my beautiful wife Melissa, she'll say, "Hey, there's two pennies missing over here." I'll say, what? Oh, let me go grab two pennies out of my pocket and I'll give you, give those to you to just fix it. And that doesn't work for her. She has to figure it out. But for me, I'm like, I'm big picture. Let's just go buy another property. That'll fix the two penny problem. You know, that's how I am. And so now let me ask you another, another question. So what has your role been in the business and what's your role like today? So early on, um, I was always very concerned about the property manager. I wanted to know, you know, every penny spent and and how everything was going. And so, um, and this was before we had a lot of kids. Um, I think I might have been pregnant at the time. Um, And so anyway, so I had 
more time on my hand at the moment. And so I was keeping track of everything and I was questioning everything. And I was like, okay, well, she's, you know, the property manager is saying she bought this. Well, I want proof that she paid for that. You know, where are the receipts? Why don't I have this? Why don't I have that? Like, I want proof. I want pictures of the work that's been done to prove that what she's saying she spent money on was actually done on our property. Um, and so I was just very, you know, involved in asking for things. Um, and my husband was more like, okay, no, we're fine. We're good. We don't need all that. And I was like, no, I want proof. I want all this. Um, and so anyways, from the beginning, what I did is I just basically kept track, you know, everything that she gave us paper wise or receipt wise, I would just chart it all out. I would use Excel and I would just, you know, make sure all everything added up, you know, to be the correct amount. And if I found any discrepancy, I was like, on top of it, I was like, okay, well, ask her, why is this not right? Why is this not right? And so anyways, so um, I was very much in, in charge of doing all that. But then um, as, you know, I gave birth and had more kids and um, we got a new property manager and things started adding up better. Um, I just kind of became more and more hands off because I, when I was just tired all the time and I just had so much going on with the babies and, and, um, you know, my two oldest kids are what, like 17, 16, 17 months apart, something like that. And so it, it was like having twins almost at times. And so, you know, I just was very busy. So anyway, so the more busy I got, the more hands off I became. Um, and now today, at this point, my hands are pretty much completely off. Um, every now and then I just might go, okay, well, you know, are, how many properties do we have not rented? Um, how many are rented? Um, and so I just kind of ask questions like that. You know, what did we bring in? What kind of expenses? But it's just more like a random here and there question about it. Just so I have a little peace of mind here and there knowing that everything's okay. But for the most part, um, I'm completely hands off. I let my husband do everything and, and take care of all that. So now that we're wrapping up, and I really appreciate it. You're, you're so pretty. So I, it really helps me to interview somebody like you. So I'm very, very blessed. Now, what advice would you give to anyone out there who is worried or concerned about investing, especially somebody's spouse, like, you know, somebody like you in a position similar and, you know, they have a, a husband who wants or a wife who wants to um, uh, really start investing, but, you know, they're really hesitant. So what advice would you give about investing and starting a business? Well, one thing I would definitely say is, you know, do your homework, map things out, you know, how much are the expenses going to be? What expenses are there going to be? Um, you know, do your math when it comes to all of that, all your homework, um, just so you have more security um, in regards to starting, because if you're just not sure, I mean, it's good to have those those numbers in, in black and white so that you do feel more comfortable with all of it. And then also, you know, do research when it comes to property managers, you know, um, not only should you interview them and ask them questions, but it'd be good to also get references and, and call those references and ask those people about the property manager just so you know that, okay, uh, there are other people that are using this person and, and, you know, they have good experience with them. Seeing everything firsthand, you know all the problems and trials and things we went through and how we've lost money. Having a property manager stealing from us or our very first property manager to having loss of rents, tenants moving out, tenants destroying the place, not uh, fixing up the place right, missing ex um, uh, different expenses, all these different problems that we had losing twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. Now, with doing that, would you recommend us, like if we were going back and look at ourselves, you know, 10, 15 years ago and say, when you start investing, don't invest in a coach or some, you know, some way like an online course or something teaching you how to invest. Don't do that. Or would you recommend to actually get coaching, get somebody walking you through, helping you to do the business right from the beginning? Well, I, you know, nowadays I would recommend that. Had you asked me when we first started, I'd be like, oh no, you know, that's a lot of money. We don't need to waste that money can figure things out. But, you know, hindsight, I'm looking back and I'm thinking, wow, it it would have been so much better had we just spent that money and gotten someone to assist us with our first property and and the property manager and just figuring all that out cuz like you said, we would have saved a lot more money. It would have been a lot less stressful and you know, th there's just so many things, so many problems and issues that that would we would have 
you know, figured out or gotten assistance with um, had we done all of that. That's great. I, you know, when we first got started, both you and I talked about, no, let's just go ahead and spend the money and try it. And looking back now, I spent at least 10 to 20 times more what I would have spent on coaching or an online course or something like that. So I'm really glad that you, you realized that too, because man, it really hit me when I realized how much money I was wasting because I didn't know what I was doing. But anyways, thank you so much, babe. You're the prettiest person I've ever had on my podcast. I love you and I really appreciate being here and hopefully everybody else is getting a lot out of it. I really appreciate it. So now that my wife has left my office and I'm ready to get back in the podcast, the rest of the podcast, what I want to also talk about, not just your spouse, but people in general, getting other people investing with you in your business as well. Cause you know, it takes money to buy properties. You know, if you use other people's money, you can buy properties much faster. So along with your spouse and how you help your spouse to get on board, what you really want to do is a few things in a step-by-step process. Number one, if you are going to be talking to your spouse, view them as an investor, somebody who you're trying to persuade, talk into, or get them to be a part of your business. That's what you want to view your spouse to be like, an investor. When you're looking to get an investor to be a part of your business, giving you their hard-earned money to buy a rental property and use that money to make more money and then pay them, you want the investor to be very safe and secure or feel very safe and secure about you and your business. And so what you want to do is you want to educate them, just like we would, I did with my wife. You want to educate the investor or whoever you're talking to. Educate them on the business, on everything about the business, because they're going to have so many questions and you need to know the answer to these questions beforehand because once you have the question, if you don't answer the question, their safety or their, their feeling that you know what you're doing and then they're going to get their money back is going to be lost. They're going to start thinking, you know what, this person doesn't really understand the business and I might not get my money back. So you need to educate yourself, number one, so that you can answer the questions properly. Number two, you need to be able to answer the questions so that the investor or your spouse or somebody gets the answer and understands it and agrees with you and says, you know what, I want to hear more. Tell me more. So number one, educate yourself. And number two, educate the person you're investing or the investor you're trying to work with. Also, the next thing, you want to walk them through every aspect of the deal. So everything from, hey, I found this deal, number one. You know, here's the deal that I have. That's the first thing you want to bring up with. Next thing is, this is the deal's number, like what, you know, how much we're going to buy it for, how much it's going to rent for, what are the expenses, what are the costs that are involved, the, you know, the closing fees, all that sort of stuff, and how much money we're going to make every single month, and how much money we're going to make in appreciation, how much money we're going to make by refinancing the property and buying more properties. You're going to walk them through every aspect of the deal as well as your business. Now, when I approach any investors that are going to help invest with me in multiple units, like apartment complexes or anything like that, I have a sit down with them and I talk with them for at least an hour, if not two hours. I just answer every single question, helping them to understand that I know what I'm doing. I've done this many, many times before and I have their interest in my heart. Like I want their interest to be taken care of over mine. I want to make sure that they are completely um, taken care of and not taken advantage of. So I'm walking them through every aspect of the deal. Now, on top of that, you also want to get them a to be very, very comfortable with the numbers and how the numbers play out. Now, a lot of people are numbers people where they, you know, they look at the numbers and it clicks in their head. There are other people that they look at numbers and they don't click in their head. I'll be completely honest. Numbers don't just click in my head. Now, my brother, he's fantastic. He'll do calculus on in his brain and it's easy for him. Me, on the other hand, I'm more, I'm better at, at, at uh, you know, I'm much better at leading lots of people or big picture vision and, and, and being a director or leader, helping teach people. I, I'm, I'm different in that regard. My brother's very, very good with numbers. Now, my wife is very, very good with numbers. So she grabs the numbers very quickly. I, on the other hand, have to spend a lot of time with the numbers, even though it's just like elementary math. It's really, really elementary math. It's so simple to do. But even though I have a hard time with the numbers, I still make my business run like a <laughs> perfect. It's like a Ferrari. I make money hand over fist. And so anybody can actually do this business. Even if you are not good at numbers, like I said, I am not good at numbers. You can absolutely do this business. Now, when you're talking to investors, 
who don't really understand the numbers, what you want to uh, actually both, you know, investors that don't understand the numbers and that do understand the numbers. Number one, if you are talking to somebody that is an investor, you want to show them how you are going to give them their num- their money back, number one, and how you're going to give them a profit, number two. Those are the big things that you want to make sure that you do, showing them that they're going to not lose their money and they're going to get their money back. It's really, really simple to do as you walk through the process of how you make money from your property, you know, income minus expenses and the equity that you're also going to get in your property and how you're going to appreciate the property. So many great things. And I talk about in my online course and I coach how to do this, but you should be able to figure this out yourself that as you walk through the deal, you want your investor to feel very comfortable with the numbers that they're going to be making money and not losing money every single month. Lastly, after they get comfortable with the numbers, you want to show them how the money will be made, how they will make money either every single month, like if it's your spouse, show them this is how much money we're going to make every single month, $250 every single month from this one property without doing work. Or if you're working with an investor, you're going to say, you know, every single quarter, you know, there's there's four quarters in a year, every single quarter, you're going to get a, a dividend payout because it's a company we're starting, you're going to get a payout, and the payout's going to be anywhere from the project numbers of like a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars a quarter that's going to be going in your pocket and then as we refinance it we could pull all of our money back out put it in our pockets to invest more you still have equity in the property anyways so there's many many ways to talk to the investors to help them feel comfortable with giving you their money remember this is their money you know i have investors that invest with me as well as other people and so they invest where they believe their money is going to be well taken care of let's quickly go over what you're going to do when talking to an investor especially somebody like your spouse so number 1 view your spouse as an investor number 2 educate and inform your spouse or your investor like educate them about the rental property business you need to show them the business help them to understand the business how you're going to manage the properties how you're going to find tenants how you're going to make the money how you're going to evict tenants how you're going to make sure that you don't lose money. So you need to educate your investor. Number three, you need to walk them through every aspect of the deal from what the deal is, how they're going to make money, how much it's going to cost, how the, what's their exit strategy, all these sort of things come up as you're working with investors. Number four, you need to get them comfortable with the numbers, helping them to understand the numbers in the property, even if they're good or bad with numbers, show them the bottom line. You're going to make this much every single month, or we as a couple, are you making $250 every single month? Or you as an investor, once a quarter, you're going to be getting $1,000 or $1,200 or $1,500 in a quarter every single quarter. You're going to be making you know this much money because this is a projection of how much money we're going to be making. Now, the lastly, you need to show them how they will make money. It could be quarterly. It could be monthly. It could be where you refinance, like I said, and pull money out. So there, these are ways, and this is just a quick overview of how you get other investors with you and pumped up about being able to invest their money and make money while they sleep. So it's really getting them comfortable with you, getting comfortable with you, taking their money, buying something, developing a business and having them be a part of the business and feel comfortable with that. All right, guys. So there has been so much talked about. I am glad I had my wife on there. Hopefully you got a lot out of what she said. I am I just infatuated with her. So I was really glad to have her on here on the podcast with me. So it was a lot of fun. Plus, like I said, she's the prettiest podcast um, guest I've ever had. So I'm really, really happy about that. And I don't think I'll find it ever anybody that's prettier than her. So you guys, thank you so much for being a part of the Master Passive Income Podcast. Really, really appreciate it. If you guys would help me out, hit that subscribe button on anywhere that you're you're listening to this. Subscribe to the podcast so that you can get the you know weekly updates. And I was really glad I was able to bag that deer, have meat in our freezer for our family, and be able to get back here to make the podcast done. All right, it's Tuesday night. It's going to go out. This podcast is going to go out in a couple hours. And you guys have been great. I thank you so much. Go ahead and get my free course. Go to masterpassiveincome.com forward slash free course. You get a free investing course there for you. Get you started. It's not the end all be all of investing courses, but it's going to help you get started so you can start learning how to invest in real estate rental properties and see if that's the route you want to go to change your life. All right, guys. Thank you so much for being a part of the show. I will see you next next week. Take care of yourselves. Get out there, start investing. Talk to your spouse, get them pumped up, get them excited about investing in real estate. All right, get out there and start investing.